George, it's great to see you. Uh, I think 2007 was the last time we we spoke and uh, we talked obviously about precision cosmology that uh, you pioneered. Uh, in recent years, you've been focusing on gravitational lensing, uh, which is uh, a, a remarkable phenomenon when you look at the uh, we look at the, the photographs uh, based on Einstein's uh, theory, theory of general relativity. Uh, tell me about gravitational lensing, uh, what it is, what the phenomena is, how it works, and why it's important now in a new era of precision cosmology. Okay. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I got interested in gravitational lensing more recently. And part of it was I got interested in seeing whether it's phenomena that affect gravity waves, the gravitational radiation that, that LIGO and Virgo were seeing. I was wondering if some of those could be gravitationally lensed, could we find a way to see that? I tried being so interested. But I also, we had done as part of Planck, but also part of the other stuff we were doing, using uh, our understanding of gravitational lensing to see how the cosmic microwave background itself was lensed by all the large scale structure between the beginning of the universe and the present. And uh, there's various other ways, but I got interested in the problem of the dark matter too. How can we distinguish the dark matter? And gravitational lensing has a lot of new features coming in the bear as we have new and better telescopes in orbit and better things to do. So I got interested in that. And so I talked to two of my colleagues from Mexico and uh, uh, Jorge and and Salvador, and who had written a, a historical paper, a brief history of gravity waves a couple of years before that, and said, we should do one on gravitational lensing because it's going to have all these applications, right, that, that people speculated about this for over 200 years, and uh, just like they had, whether there were black holes back to sort of Newtonian era, but it wasn't until general relativity came along that people took it seriously, and it, and the, the, the eclipse of 1919, we were coming up on the 100th anniversary <laughs> when we decided to write this paper. And uh, that's what demonstrated Einstein's theory to be correct. Uh, right. describe, and that, it, describe that briefly, because that will give a sense of, uh, uh, in a simple way, of what gravitational so, lens. So I, I have to make it this year. So I was excited about the new applications, but particularly Salvador, and Jorge, but Salvador was really interested in the history. And so he was writing the part on the history. I was writing the part on the formulas and so forth, which actually got cut out of the paper. <laughs> That's what I went to. They said, it's already in a bunch of other papers. And I said, yeah, I went through all those other papers. And they said, and besides now, anything that looks the same as any other paper, they're worried about whether you plagiarize it or whatever. And I said, well, you know, they run these programs. And of course, the equations are going to look the same because you want to use the same notations. But anyway, so we eventually left it out. But he put all the, he he went back and did a lot of history, and did a great job. I find it interesting, exciting to read. But this goes back to very early times when people were speculating that light could be a particle or a wave, and that if it's a particle, it would be bent passing by the sun or passing by a large body, and calculated the the, the bending, which in those days we were able to calculate it. That it would should be just less than an arc second, 1.85 arc second. That, that's purely by gravitate, by, by just the Newtonian. Just gravitation. Just, it's a particle on this Newtonian, right? And Einstein wrote his general relativity and he started speculating because it got pushed by several different people, including, you know, people who who we would call refugees or immigrants, <laughs> people who left difficult situations in Europe or other places and came to the US, and a couple of them came by and saw Einstein when he was uh, working in Princeton and convinced him to, you know, or I think it was there, convinced him to actually write an article about it and so forth. And he did, and he thought, well, it'd be too small to ever see, right? <laughs> but but to, to actually see a lens of events. And, but Einstein had, had been worried before about seeing the bending of light. And there he got convinced it could be done. That's why he was still in Europe. And, uh, Eventually, he convinced people to do the eclipse excavations that that is is very famous. There's a there's a really wonderful piece by a very great writer about how dramatic it was for these guys to stand up under the portrait of Newton 
at the Royal Society and <laughs> and do and do the, 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 the do Newtonian physics then and replace it with general relativity. And uh, but it's a uh, thing. But the, the lensing he didn't come around to until a little bit later, and he didn't think it would be so useful. And when you look at the numbers, the lensing of stars by stars isn't very likely. But you know, Zwicky and other people realized. Uh, galaxies could lens galaxies because galaxies are much bigger and more massive and the angles and the scales are now on the scales you can measure with astronomical instruments. But it still took until the late 50s before anybody actually saw a gravitational lens and detected it. And they saw it by accident. They were measuring quasars and they found two quasars has exactly the same spectra. Mm -hmm. And they thought the telescope operator had looked had pointed the same thing twice. And in fact, he hadn't, he pointed the two different images and they, they, they checked with a colleague and he had time the next night. So he went and measured again with himself watching and got a better spectra and found that they were identical. And then they realized they had found the gravitational lens, a quasar that was gravitationally lens, which is about the best thing. And then people started taking it really seriously. But the theory was there well ahead of time it wasn't until people started actually observing it that you started taking it seriously. But it's really been the last decade that people have been making tremendous scientific tool out of gravitational lensing and really starting to understand. And, you know, at the time we were writing the paper, there was a very nice paper out by the, the, the very large array and, and uh, looking at a thing that a CMB experiment, the South Pole telescope had seen, which they thought was an Einstein ring. And they made a very beautiful image of this with the, with the interferometer, with the big interferometer set up. And uh, it's almost a complete Einstein ring. So if light is bent by a, a galaxy and you're perfectly in line behind that, so there's a straight line from the far away galaxy to the galaxy that's imaging to us, you don't see the light directly, but you see the light that's bent around and you get a beautiful circle that's called the Einstein, you know, mm -hmm. Einstein ring or the Einstein, you know, uh, effect. Uh, although he was the second guy to predict it. Uh, he, he gets the credit because <laughs> he had the theory that I went with it. Um, anyway, there's a really beautiful image of the Einstein ring that shows it so precisely and so on. So he did that. But then there are also many new images that have four or five images where you have a galaxy just off behind the galaxy and you end up with these this set of usually you see four bright bright images and those are being used to do timing between you know the quasar is there it has a signal the signal goes up and down you can look at each of the images and see the signal go up and down look at the time delay that measures the geometry that allows you to determine the Hubble expansion rate so that's wow. one of the things. It's wow. called a holy cow for age zero <laughs> lensing and waiting. And so so obviously, the Hubble expansion rate is one of the critical um, uh, uncertainties today in, in, in precision cosmology. There, there is a there is a controversy going on. Uh, it's it's uh, being stirred up by observations and by some of the people in it, and um, but there's a discrepancy between the expansion rate people see at great distances, which is also, if you look out a great distance, you're looking back in time. I mean, if you look out a billion light years, you're looking back a billion years. If you look 10 billion light years away, you're looking back 10 billion years. The people who are doing the nearby supernova, you know, the nearby supernova and distance scale and so forth and measuring things locally to see the variables, they're, they're getting a different value for the Hubble expansion rate. They call it the constant, but I tried, I tried for years to argue that it should be called the Hubble expansion rate, but I lost. Everybody calls it H, H not. It's like a con, but it isn't a constant. It varies in times. So the universe was expanding more rapidly in the past and it slowed down and slowed down and slowed down. And then with the acceleration, the universe has caught, started to go back up. And if you look, the theory and the near and the intermediate observations, they all fall on this nice curve. Mm. But then the very nearby stuff is too high, right? And so, not by a huge amount, it's like 5%. And that's, but nowadays we're in precision cosmology, 5% yeah. is <laughs> <laughs> And so, 
And exactly. so that's a controversy that people think says there's something we're leaving out or there's that other, or somebody's making a big mistake. <laughs> you know, <laughs> could be any number of things. And it's exciting for the people who are involved. Is gravitational lensing a, uh, an independent uh, technique that can shed light on that? Well, the gravitational lensing should be able to shed light on that. The problem is one of statistics. As the new survey comes, we hope when JWST comes up, there'll be more and LSST comes online. There'll be many more lenses found and there'll be sufficient statistics to try and, and use that alternate way to try and determine what's going on. And, and we'll see what happens. A basic question with gravitational lensing is, is you have the image, you can have two or you can have multiple images as, as you've said, but there are two things going on. There's the, there's the object in, in the far background and then there's the, uh, the lens in, in, the, in the nearer background, the galaxy that's doing so. How do you differentiate um, from one piece of data the, the, two, uh, the two variables that are causing it? <laughs> yes. So here's where you end up making models, right? And so in the very beginning, people made very simple models of galaxies. They called it an isothermal sphere. That is a constant temperature sphere. So it's just like a ball of gas. Right. And, this, and they make a model like that and then they calculate the, the trajectories of the light around that. And now people are getting more sophisticated modeling of what the mass distribution might be. Um, and there are other cases that one of the things that I thought was very interesting and eventually comes to our topic about dark matter is you can look at a cluster of galaxies, a very large cluster of galaxies and do gravitational lensing of the fields behind it. Take all the fields through there and all of them are or stretched or elongated or magnified in various ways. You can then try and map it and reconstruct the, the, the mass potential that, you know, what, where the masses are. And so one of, the, one of the pictures that I sent shows a beautiful picture where you see the cluster is this big kind of a bowl with all these mountains on it, which are the individual galaxies. And that's the kind of thing that you can, you, you can do with the lensing. You start being able to reconstruct if you have enough statistics, that is, you have a lot of background galaxies, not just one, but many, you can start to reconstruct mm. what is doing the imaging. And we have another example of that, which is the, the bullet cluster, which is two clusters that have collided with each other and passed through each other. Oh. And the galaxies, when you have a cluster of galaxies, they go through each other, the galaxies generally miss each other. Mostly it's empty space, the galaxies just go, right? And the dark matter just goes swish. But the gas, the gas goes wham, it makes a, a, a thermal shock. It gets compressed, it makes a thermal shock, and it makes x-rays. And if you look at that, you can see it, the, the image, you can see it in x-rays in one set of colors. You can see it in you know, visible light, the galaxies, and then in lensing in blue in the, in the image that I said. And it's uh, it's clear you can separate them out, and it's clear that it is, um, you know, you see that whatever this dark matter is, it doesn't stay with the bulk of the matter, which is the gas, it stays with the galaxies. Now, does that mean there's something magic that galaxies, are, or it just mean the dark matter doesn't interact when it passes through, it just passes through? And it's just gravitationally going to come back and eventually merge, right? Just the way the galaxies will. Or, you know, is there some really weird thing going on? Because there are people who try and come up with models that make gravity change depending upon what the ordinary mass is there in order to do that. That's really difficult to do that when you have this kind of an example of a bullet cluster. So the lensing in conjunction with the x rays and the optical really give you a big handle. And that's true of some other lensing. Sometimes you can look, look in the visible light and see the galaxy and know something about what's going on, as well as doing the measuring of the, of the thing. But yes, it's now a weakness of that. Now, one of the other things, though, that's very powerful is that have you ever looked in a swimming pool and you see these crazy lines of light in the bottom of the pool? Those are called caustics. Those are places where, on the surface waves, the light has sort of focused and crossed. And when it's a very sharp light, they're mostly focusing together, but then they move around and they move away. Well, you get caustics 
when you look through a galaxy cluster or a galaxy with a lot of stuff in it, you get these caustics if you're right in the right angle and right straight up. If you then monitor with your great new telescope <laughs> in space, thing in this caustic, when big stars cross across the caustic or primordial black holes or some other sort of thing cross across that caustic, you will see this interesting variation that goes on or in the model that we have of the really strange kind of dark matter where it's wave dark matter and you have this, this complicated wave structure, it will cause that caustic to have this, this extra waviness to it, like my tie or something. It's, it's a, uh, you know, it's, so it turns out there are many new tools coming up that are starting to be exploited, but we're in a situation where we think, oh yes, <laughs> we're, we're gonna have good time now. We're gonna have a lot of new data, a lot of new things to see. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.